Hi, welcome to our uh, latest um, uh, session as part of Renters' Rights Awareness Week. Um, this session is about uh, what you need to know when you're leaving a tenancy and starting a new one. Um, we're joined by uh, three experts uh, who will be taking us through different aspects of uh, ending and starting tenancies. Um, first up is Sandy Bastin, who is Head of Adjudication Services uh, the dispute service which operates the tenancy deposit scheme. Um, Sam Hurst uh, has spent uh, some uh, time working in the lettings industry. He's recently left and has uh, a bunch of uh, insider secrets that he's able to share with us. Um, Andy Sheriff uh, is investigator at the National Trading Standards Estate and Letting Agency team uh, and I am Dan Wilson Craw. I'm Deputy Director of Generation Rent. Um, if you have any questions uh, for the pa uh, for the panelists, we'll be uh, talking. We'll, there'll be an opportunity to ask those uh, after after the three presentations. Um, so if uh, you can do that in the Q and A, um, and we'll uh, uh, we'll get started with Sandy. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, welcome to everyone this evening. So uh, the Tenancy Deposit Scheme is here to enable landlords and agents to comply with the legislation in relation to protecting deposits. Um, and we're also here to provide um, a free alternative dispute resolution service at the end of a tenancy in the event that the parties are unable to reach agreement as to, to the distribution of the deposit. So we're going to have a look at tenancy deposit protection and uh, particularly about avoiding disputes. So rights around deposit protection. It is the agent and landlord uh, responsibility to protect the deposit within 30 days of receipt and also to serve prescribed information again within 30 days of receipt. If the deposit has been paid by someone other than the tenant, then they are known as the relevant person. So they're defined within the act as the relevant person and they will need to receive prescribed information also. And you should also be prescribed, uh, provided with the scheme leaflet. Failure to comply with the legislation results in pen penalties. However, this is not policed by TDS. Uh, please be aware also that um, the uh, deposit cap in England is five weeks rent, um, 50,000 and over 50,000 is six weeks rent as a deposit. So moving in, um, really, really important for you to um, ha have a, a good look at your tenancy agreement, make sure you read it and understand it as it sets out the obligations of the parties. There should be a provision of a check-in or inventory report, and this is vital for the purposes of adjudication um, at the end of the tenancy, um, and it should record the condition and cleanliness at tenancy start. Make sure that you amend uh, the check-in report with any discrepancies on inspection and return it to the landlord or the agent with any within an, any specified time frame. It's important to have um, a good audit trail of agreement of the check-in and inventory report, report between all the parties. If for whatever reason you're not provided with a check-in or an inventory, then do ask for one. And if you still do not get one, then um, it's, it's quite sensible to prepare your own or perhaps take photographs so that you have some evidence as to the condition and cleanliness of the property at the start of the tenancy. So mid-tenancy, during the tenancy, report any issues that arise. It's an obligation generally in a tenancy agreement for um, a tenant to report anything that they become aware of. Um, do seek permission, for example, for redecoration and reach agreement as to how the property is to be returned at the end of the tenancy, there may be a condition attached to that agreement which is to be reinstated to the same colour perhaps at the, as at the start. Um, do you seek consent to bring a pet into the property and understand any additional responsibilities that um, flow from that consent? And please ensure that you obviously keep the property well ventilated and heated, which is a general obligation usually within a tenancy agreement. So moving out, um, check your tenancy agreement for notice provisions to ensure that you comply with those uh, notice requirements. A pre-checkout inspection may be carried out 
it's not always the case, but they're very, very useful uh, to enable you to have some indication of what is going to perhaps be deducted from the deposit and give you an opportunity to rectify any areas. It's the tenant responsibility to return the property to the same standard and level of cleanliness as at the start of the tenancy. And also, um, generally, a tenancy agreement will contain an obligation for all items within the property to be returned to the position located at the start of the tenancy. Make sure that if there is any damage that you carry out repair works and attend the checkout if at all possible and be ready um, for the inventory clerk to, to carry out their checkout. Also, don't forget areas that um, uh, we often see from an adjudication perspective that aren't referred to on check-in and check-out reports, but things like gardens, removal of rubbish, uh, make sure freezers are defrosted, replace light bulbs uh, where, um, where they've blown during the tenancy, ensure that you have uh, taken meter readings and ensure that the keys are returned in accordance with the terms of the tenancy agreement. So at the end of the tenancy, um, claiming the deposit back. So communication is really key between the parties. Um, really have um, a discussion with the agent or the landlord and try and, uh, where possible, reach agreement. And think to yourself whether there are actually grounds for a deduction and is it worth perhaps challenging it. Um, look to see whether the uh, deductions proposed are reasonable and they allow for fair wear and tear. If there is good check-in evidence at the start of the tenancy and good e check-out evidence at the end of the tenancy, you should easily be able to see whether the uh, claims that are being made are fair and reasonable. Counterclaims are not considered as part of uh, a TDS um, adjudicator's remit um, and if you um, if at all possible, you should hopefully reach agreement by negotiation with the key documents in place um, at the start and at the end of the tenancy. So how to dispute deductions. So in the event that an agreement is unable to be reached between the parties, um, then the uh, tenancy deposit scheme provides an alternative dispute resolution service, uh, which is available, and it is an alternative to court. There are strict time, time frames um, to raise a dispute if the deposit has been in, uh, protected under an insured scheme and uh, make sure you have evidence to support um, uh, anything that you want to say to rebut an, an agent or landlord claim. And the reason for that is it's not possible to rely upon a statement alone from a, um, an adjudication perspective, it's documentary based evidence. So. If you have asked for permission to do something, then have an audit trail, make sure you have an audit trail so that you will be able to provide that at the end of the tenancy to show that you did ask for permission and it was given to you. Um, once you're invited into dispute, uh, either by raising a dispute or um, uh, responding to a dispute, make sure that you uh, check your emails regularly and respond to the dispute within the set timeframe and upload or, or provide all the evidence that you wish to submit. Um, we have a team of impartial adjudicators that will make a decision uh, based on the documentary evidence and the decision by the adjudicator will be final and binding. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Sandy. Um, that, was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, can I uh, can I ask a couple of things just to clarify some of your points? Um, when when you talk about prescribed information, what should tenants be sort of looking out for? What, what does that prescribed information look like? So it's generally um, attached to um, um, a tenancy agreement or um, provided separately. It's important also that um, a tenant, uh, prescribed information is not served too early. It has to be within 30 days of receipt of the deposit. Um, so it really is um, a, a, a prescribed form which sets out the initial requirements of uh, the scheme providers, sets out the details of the tenancy, the property address, the scheme provider, um, where um, sort of contact details for the end of the tenancy, uh, which is important uh, for the purposes of um, being able to distribute the deposit at the end of the tenancy. Thanks. Um, and you, uh, you mentioned there about leaving the tenancy at the end, making making good any damage. Um, I know that sometimes uh, tenancy agreements will say you you shouldn't um, you should always commu communicate to the landlord if there's anything, any damage or, or repairs that they need doing. And if you want to attempt the repairs yourself, 
contact contact the landlord about that is that presumably that would be yes absolutely so so if anything arises mid-tenancy that you notice for example if there's perhaps a leak um, on the you know kitchen floor or coming from underneath the washing machine then it's responsibility of a tenant to report that issue to the agent and landlord so that they can take steps to rectify the matter without um, uh, you know exacerbating the the the, uh, the damage but if for example there's um, little bits and pieces that you you perhaps might do in a sort of tenant-like manner um, such as um and you might want to touch up or you might, uh, if, if, if you, the toilet seat's broken, you might want to replace it. Um, then, um, you know, little, little um, jobs like that um, could, could save uh, a, a deduction from the deposit. And this is when a, a, a pre-checkout is, a report is, is useful uh, because it gives an indication as to what um, perhaps is, has been noticed within the property and what um, uh, is likely to cause um, a proposed deduction from the deposit. So it gives you an opportunity to, to rectify, for example, perhaps, you know, the, the, the lawn ne needs mowing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, if a landlord hasn't provided an inventory, um, does that kind of put, put the landlord at a disadvantage when it comes to making claims at the end of the tenancy, would you say? So the, the primary, as I've mentioned, it is a documentary based evidence. Um, so it's not possible for either party to just rely upon a statement alone. So, uh, you know, the landlord was to say, well, I can assure you it was clean at the start. Um, it, the adjudicator um, needs to see documents to, to actually support that statement. Um, the same way that if the tenant was to say, I can assure you it wasn't clean at the start of the tenancy, then the tenant would need to provide evidence to support that statement also. So um, a, a landlord or agent's claim on behalf of the landlord um, will be, uh, is likely to be compromised in the event that there is no check-in report um, or check-out report um, uh, because there's no, no real way of the uh, adjudicator uh, being able to conclude what the standard of cleanliness and condition was at the start of the tenancy and at the end of the tenancy. There may be some other evidence that perhaps a landlord might have that uh, would persuade an adjudicator that the property was clean and similarly um, evidence that a tenant might might um, have that would uh, suggest that it wasn't. Um, so for example if there was a, a very detailed professional cleaning invoice uh, provided by the landlord uh, which was undertaken the day before uh, the, the, the start of the tenancy agreement, then it might be that the adjudicator might be persuaded that it was clean. But the adjudicator would be looking to see whether the tenant actually made any comment at the start of the tenancy um, or reported their um, unhappiness with the level standard of clean. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions to come. Um, we'll move on to Andy now. Um, uh, Andy's involved in enforcing uh, the Tenant Fees Act and amongst other bits of legislation uh, as part of the National Authority around um, uh, trading standards. Uh, so Andy, over to you. Okay, hi. Good evening, everybody. And if I can find a way to share my screen of the thousands of things I've got here. I may need to ask for some help. And when I do that, let's go with that one. That's me. Um, I'm Andy Chef, and I'm an investigator working for the National Trading Standards Estate and Letting Agency team. Um, um, sorry, Andy, we, have, you, do, have, you, um, have you hit the green button at the bottom? Of the I screen? may have done. Um, that's, that's the... There should be a green button on, on Zoom that allows you to share your screen. There should be, and I can't. Just... it's all going away. I'm going to try once, once more on that. No, I, I apologise, that's disappeared from my options. Tilly, come and get... save me. <laughs> if you send me the PowerPoint, I can share it on here if that's easier. Um, I'll see if I can get mine. Yeah, it's gone. Say. It's gone to Dan. My f my first one is just is just my name and the fact I work for National Trading Standards Estate and Letting Agency team. Um, we are funded through the National Trading Standards Service and the Chartered Trading Standards Institute to be the lead enforcement authority for 
two pieces of legislation, the Estate Agents Act from 1979 and the Tenant Fees Act 2019. And that's um, the prime part of what, I, what I'm going to talk about today. Tenant Fees Act, I think um, you must remember, I don't know where our audience are sat, but Tenant Fees Act only applies in England. Um, strange, it doesn't apply in Wales, doesn't apply in Scotland or Northern Ireland. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, so when I talk about the things that are covered by the Tenant Fees Act, if you're geographically somewhere a bit further away, please remember you may have similar rights, but the legislation doesn't cover them. Uh, my team is a national team and we're the lead enforcement agency for those pieces of things. But actually, if you need help, if you need advice, you will need to contact your local council who've got powers and duties under the act so we can give you we can give them guidance um, we can to centralize ideas we can help to get people together but the actual enforcement will be coming from your local council um you probably know where they are but of all the things that you're doing when when you get the tenancy take five minutes just to find out where your local council is, where your local advice services are, so that you can be in touch with them. If I might ask for my second and other slide, I'm going to take you through um, the things that are permitted fees, permitted payments under the Tenant Fees Act. Now, I'll, I'll say this now, anything else is not a permitted payment, and if it's not a permitted payment, it's a prohibited payment, okay? These are the words that I've chosen um, to describe the types of payments that you might pay. You may see them under very slightly different terms. So be aware not to take it as verbatim words, but you will find that these are the only permitted payments that can be made. So if your letting agent comes up with anything else, whether it's some kind of check-in fee, whether they're going to charge you something extra for keeping pets or things. Those are not in themselves permitted payments. But if I can just run through the list, holding deposit, so that can only be one week's rent and that's why you're making up your mind whether you want that flat, where you just want to hold it, you want to keep it while you're trying to get your bits of paperwork together where the other side are checking up as well they may need to ask you just to prove you know that you've got some kind of income so they can hold it for you for one week's rent they should not be taking more than one holding deposit at a time for one room for one tenancy um, the second bit of my slides which which have gone slightly is talking about the actual deposit for the premises and, and that um, Sandy stole my thunder slightly by saying that it's five weeks rent um, unless you're renting a property which is in excess of 50,000 a year in terms of rent. Um, you also will be asked to lodge a deposit, uh, we've done the deposit, and you must pay your rent. So we're talking about the fact that um, you must pay your rent regularly and, and the intervals should be regular as well. Um, it shouldn't be the case that the agent asks you to put everything up front. It shouldn't be that they say that, oh, you, you can pay a thousand pound this month and 800 pounds next month and similar. Um, it should actually be the case that they are regularly payments. Normally they're going to be weekly, uh, monthly. For some people they will be um, paid weekly. So we've got the slides back again. Um, there's a section asking you for default payments. Um, this is terminology used in the legislation and this is about when you've lost things. So keys and security cards are given as some kind of practical examples. You might be asked to pay damages um, if you've somehow broken something 
and the landlord says that's fine we'll get we'll get that sorted out right now but you will have to pay for that and i think most people readily understand that that's the kind of thing they have to pay and of course unpaid rent you shouldn't be in a circumstance where you have unpaid rent ideally um, but if it is that's a default payment which uh, the landlord can ask from you and is classed as one of those permitted payments next line comes with those slightly legally kind of terms variation assignment novation and these are about taking the agreement that you've already had at the beginning of your tenancy and either asking at your request to vary it to change something that might um, be suited so you may need to change the circumstances of it slightly it might be assignation actually passing the tenancy over to somebody else or assigning a responsibility to somebody or novation to actually start the tenancy agreement over again but these are things that are all at the tenant's request so they are potentially putting the landlord to a little bit of bother and for that they're allowed to make a charge not a big charge reasonable fees but they can charge for those kind of things and also next line down about early termination charges okay you may be nine months into your one year tenancy agreement and for one reason or other you may decide that you need to drop out of that that can be done um, but as i think we might explore a little bit later if we've got time the landlord is still entitled to expect that either he's going to get the rent for the rest of the agreed period or that if they can get another tenant in to replace you there will be some kind of charge for the admin that goes with it and lastly there's a whole collection of things which will be things bills that you would expect to pay the normal normal running costs of a household unless you've got one of those all-inclusive agreements then you should expect and you will be expected to pay the utility bills the gas the electric water uh, you will be expected to pay council tax unless you're exempt you will be expected to cover the, the tv license as well um, costs of broadband all of those sorts of things um, but what I, what I should say to you is you now if you've got an agreement that says things are included in the rent then they should be and they can't be changed by the landlord and agent halfway through i've had some questions about potential scams um, that, that come with letting agencies um, i haven't got a slide on this but really i i think if you're not familiar with the agent you're dealing with spend just a little bit of time to actually check out whether they belong to a redress scheme whether they can actually show you the property inside and out before you pay any kind of money so don't don't just simply accept that there's some kind of covid rule that says uh, th that you're not allowed to have a look inside it and not allowed to see what it looks like don't meet people on a street corner and accept that them by them waving their arms towards a building that they own it because that's not the case and i would say there is of course legislation that is there to protect you to back you up and to help get you back on an even footing if you got into trouble but don't take that as a kind of bulletproof vest that is going to help you um, when you enter into some kind of letting agreement you're paying over a substantial sum of money and just as in the same way as you wouldn't walk down a dark alley and wander through blindly saying well it's right uh, 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 you know there's a law against mugging me yeah possibly so but if you think it looks a bit risky don't take that chance um don't look for the legislation to be your safeguard but just do a little bit of work beforehand and it will make you a much stronger and safer 
person in all. Thank you, Tilly. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, that was, uh, yeah, that was fascinating. Thank you. Um, I suppose I had one one quick question on um, uh, on on your slides. Um, you mentioned damage um, being allowed to be charged as a permitted fee. Now, um, one one question uh, people may have is that that they've paid a deposit, which is intended to cover the damage. Are there particular times when that when landlords can charge? For damage during a during a tenancy, or or should they be um, uh, should they be able to um, should should they only be able to uh, charge it uh, by making a claim on the deposit at the end of the tenancy? And maybe Sandy uh, has, has a view on that as well. I, I think it's something that's going to come by mutual agreement, and, and Sandy might be able to sort of talk from her extensive experience of the kind of claims that come in. Yeah, and the deposit certainly is there to cover damages at the end of the tenancy um, and, and not just the fair wear and tear, but, but um, to actual damages to things. But if you are looking to move on to a new tenancy, you're likely to want to get all of your deposit back. And if you know some of that is tied up with the potential damage to you know a broken window or some kind of bathroom fitting that actually you could have sorted out during the term of your tenancy to make your life much simpler um, and by agreement with the landlord yes you may choose to, to pay that um, rather than seeing your deposit dwindle away or, or have some kind of debate about it right at the end of the tenancy so it's something that's permitted it doesn't mean that the landlord has to do it um, but certainly you should expect you know, as anyone occupying a house do, does, if something gets broken, own up and see what's the best arrangement to make your life comfortable, because uh, you're going to carry on living in the property and not find yourself with difficulties at the end. Okay, thanks. And and Sandy, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, no, I agree with Andy. Obviously, um, if you're if you're satisfied that. Um, uh, the, the damage has been caused um, uh, by your own actions. Um, then yes, it may be something that you want to you want to sort out and arrange during the tenancy uh, and uh, and fix. But um, but certainly uh, the Tenant Fees Act does allow um, uh, a claim from the deposit uh, for damages at the end of the tenancy, subject to uh, the the appropriate evidence. Thanks. Um, now we'll move on to Sam. Uh, so uh, hopefully by the time you've uh, sort of absorbed um, Sandy's and Andy's uh, advice about ending a tenancy, finding an a letting agent who will treat you uh, with uh, with respect and dignity, um, you will apply for a tenancy. And Sam is here to tell you about what happens next. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah. I'll just share a few slides I've prepared, which I hope you can now see. Um, cool, I'm assuming you can. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's sad, but probably true uh, what Andy said about not relying on um, legislation to be a safeguard as a tenant. Um, I think like letting agents are behind only bankers and politicians in terms of public perceptions of trustworthiness. Um, and malpractice is rife, um, but it's and it's a shame we don't have the resources to be able to kind of clamp down on that a bit more and protect tenants when they're looking for a new home. But hopefully, some of the tips and tricks, and as Dan said, industry secrets um, that have come to my mind in the last couple of years will be able to help you. Um, so yeah, uh, what to know when you're applying to end the properties? Um, unlike the practical side, it's really good to know how quickly your local uh, rental market moves. So if you're in somewhere really high demand, like in London, then um, properties may only be advertised two or three weeks before the landlord or agent wants tenants to move in. Um, and if you're expecting to move in somewhere, you know, in three months time, the property you move into may not even be on the market yet. So it's really important to know that stuff. Conversely, if you're a student uh, in a student town and you're looking to rent a place 
um, for the following academic year, um, then you may need to be looking, you know, in November, December, January to find a house to start like next September. So it's really important to know uh, how quickly the local, how quickly the local rental market moves where you're looking for a home. And you can kind of do that by just speaking to other renters or speaking to agents if you have to, um, or going on, uh, you know, uh, on websites where people talk about renty stuff like Reddit is really good. Every, every town has its own like Reddit board basically and you can just ask on there, that's quite handy. Um, it's also really good when you are in the process of viewing places to kind of know what you and your co-tenants red lines are going to be when it comes to price and bedrooms and different features. So if you know that there's no way in hell you're going to accept a place that doesn't have a living room or doesn't have a garden, um, you can just, you know, not look at those places. But if, if you're a bit flexible on price, then it's good to know before you go in there what you've kind of agreed as your red lines are. That will allow you to act quickly when you're negotiating with an agent or a landlord or just, um, yeah, uh, negotiating that initial move in or like tentative agreement um, before you place a holding deposit without being pressured by them to accept something you haven't fully thought through. And I think that's really important is whenever you are going to go into an interaction with an agent or a landlord to not feel pressured because you've kind of thought this stuff through beforehand like classic sales technique is just to put a load of pressure on you, say that there's loads of other people viewing the property, um, things like this. Uh, but if you if you kind of have your red line sorted out beforehand, then hopefully it'll make you immune to this kind of pressure. So yeah, um, when you're moving, you can rent the property and it's either going to be shown to, or advertised or marketed by a landlord or an agent. Um, and there's some differences. So yeah, I'm not representing any specific organization really today. So I feel very happy to say that agents do lie a lot. Um, I, as a tenant, I wouldn't take an agent's word for anything, whether that's their interpretation of what the law is, whether that's what they've said the landlords instructed them to do, uh, whether they, whether you notice something at a viewing and, they, and you say, oh, will that be fixed by the time I move in? And they say, yeah, definitely. Like I wouldn't take any of those things um, uh, I wouldn't take their word for any of those things that if, if they come up. If you do agree anything or you need to get anything agreed that's important to you with an agent um, or a landlord really, um, then make sure you get it agreed in writing uh, in an email usually um, as soon as you can because if you don't have a, a written agreement to show when it comes to you, for example, some dispute around a holding deposit you've placed uh, and you uh, so, for example, if you place a holding deposit on the condition that, um, you know, uh, the mold in the bathroom will be professionally sorted and then it isn't sorted and then you don't and uh, you, you don't want the property anymore and you want your holding deposit back, then if you don't have that written down, it's going to be very hard for you to, to win that uh, argument. Um, yeah, so look out for like little tricks as well. So some thing a friend had uh, last year they told me about was um, they uh, let they were renting a property with a very big high street name in lettings that I'm sure you all probably have heard of um, and the agent they, they signed it they, they'd lined up the contract and everything was due to go ahead and, and, and they got a message from the agent just saying oh we won't be able to let you sign this contract until you've bought this contents insurance because the property needs to the contents uh, need to be insured um, so basically that's a prohibited payment because they're making a payment to a third party, a condition of the let. So it's really important to look out for things like that as well. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, there's just, there's, there's many traps that, uh, unscrupulous agents can try to force you into. I think generally landlords are slightly easier to deal with. They're letting their own property. They know the property probably because they might have lived in it or they've bought it themselves. They're responsible for the maintenance of it at the end of the day. Um, and they haven't devoted their lives to a career in letting agency. So I find that they're probably usually a bit easier to deal with. So my advice if possible would be try and find a place directly, uh, renting directly for a landlord with no managing uh, agent if you can. Um, another like key part of moving into a new place is referencing. So a lot of tenants don't realize that re referencing is, uh, it's a product now that agents mainly sell to landlords and that landlords use to feel like they've mitigated risk, um, 
when they're renting out a property so they feel safer because they've done background checks on the tenants moving in um even though like the reference checks themselves are, would be very easy to to fake very easy to con if you wanted to as a tenant but what they do do uh, is if all the tenants pass referencing or they can provide or a tenant who fails can provide a guarantor who passes referencing then the landlord can get rent guarantee insurance which means if you stop paying the rent there's an insurance policy which may pay out the rent to the landlord whilst they try and evict you so that's the reason a lot of landlords really want referencing and the reason a lot of agents will uh, go for referencing is because it's something they can charge uh, landlords 100 quid for and it costs the agent maybe 20 quid to do so you know they're making you know um 80 quid profit on every reference that they do so they're going to try and reference everyone they can basically um yeah so it's important to keep that in mind that's what referencing is really doing it's not it's not really an assessment of your character um there's a pass and a fail at the end of it that can make you feel quite bad if you fail referencing but really it's a gateway product to an insurance thing for the landlord um often people will fail referencing sometimes for silly reasons like they are self-employed uh, and they can't prove their income in a way that um, the referencing company wants them to be able to. Or maybe, uh, I'll come to this a little bit later, but maybe the referencing company doesn't include benefits in its assessment of, of your income and things like that. So if this happens, there are some things you can do to try and make the tenancy work if you still want the property. Um, you can offer, if you fail referencing, you can offer to add a guarantor to the agreement. So this is someone who will um, often a family member or a friend or maybe an employer even, or sometimes a local authority in, in some cases or a charity. Uh, it's, it's someone who will um, agree to take on uh, the duties of the tenant in terms of paying rent um, if the tenant fails to take them on. Um, so yeah, agents like guarantors because it's they have to reference the guarantor as well. So that's another 80 quid there. So the, the agent will probably love that. Um, you can offer rent in advance to mitigate risk. So uh, this is popular with landlords um, because you're, you're basically saying, uh, I know I've failed referencing, which makes you think I'm risky as a tenant, but what if I give you three or six months rent up front? Uh, then there's less risk because you've already got all that money in the bank. Nothing bad can really happen for six months' time. Um, so the two obvious term, like shortfalls of that are if you fail referencing on affordability criteria, you're probably not going to have the money to be able to offer that. But, but if you are able to offer that, it probably will win around a lot of landlords. Um, but secondly, it also disempowers you because one of the one of the you know the best card a tenant can ever play is just not paying rent um, in certain circumstances. A lot of people will advise you not to do that, but it is a card you have. You can just decide not to pay rent. Um, and see if that applies any pressure or changes things when you're negotiating with your landlord or agent. Um, I'm sure, yeah, that that's not to be done lightly, but it is something tenants can do. Um, you can also try and demonstrate what savings you have and what income you have to the landlord. Um, because as we've said, referencing schemes are often very specific about what they, what they want uh, in terms of proving your income. So, uh, so referencing companies really love people who are paid on pay-as-you-earn um, and salaries, but if you are self-employed or you claim benefits, it's, it's much harder for them to uh, approve your type of income in a way that lets you pass referencing. Um, if you think you're likely to fail referencing, it's, it's a bit of an art knowing when to bring this up with the landlord or agent. So you might, if you say straight away to an agent, I'm not going to pass referencing that, that might put them off and they might just go to another tenant. So I'd say probably don't mention it straight away, but perhaps at the viewing, you could say, you know, I may not pass referencing, but hit, but you know, some of these choices above these three options, guarantor, rent right in advance, demonstrating your income are, are ways you can get around that. Um, yeah, so this is just a little bit about benefits that I mentioned earlier. So yeah, referencing companies don't, uh, count benefits often as, as part of your income um, and also lenders as in mortgage mortgage lenders will often refuse the landlord's permission to let the property to tenants on benefits and that means some landlords feel like they can't do that um, which is partly to to which partly explains the reason for the low number of properties on the market which say explicitly or implicitly that they'll accept tenants 
uh, who apply who are claiming benefits. Um, now, whether that's unlawful or not, I think there have been two cases um, that were ruled on where a, an agent had a blanket ban on all DSS or benefit claims, and, and those would, would seem to be unlawful. But uh, and by blanket ban, I mean a, a company-wide policy of rejecting out of hand all applicants who claim benefits. Um, but if the agent is a bit more nuanced and um, subtle in their discrimination, then I don't, I don't think, as far as I've seen, that a case where an agent has done that um, in a more subtle way has, has been ruled on yet. So I think, I think really we don't know if, if no DSS is unlawful yet. It may be if it goes to court and is ruled on, but I think we just don't know yet. Uh, but that's just my opinion so far. Um, I think if you are a tenant claiming benefits, then open rent and spare room are probably some of the best places to find benefit-friendly properties because you can speak to real humans um and the, in, because because you're renting directly from landlords there is no company-wide no dss policy um but even on these sites the the rates that will accept people benefits are quite low um what we got yeah my last slide here so uh finally just a little word on deposit replacement products um so yeah just these are basically products that have been brought to market that to the tenant it's it basically says you don't have to pay a, a tenancy deposit all in one go up front. Maybe you can you can pay. Um, you, there's a few different models, but maybe you, you pay a little bit extra in rent, and then that kind of tops the deposit up as you go through the tenancy. Um, or maybe uh, you pay one week's rent um, for access to the product, but then if you need to use the tenancy resolution service that it provides, then you have to pay extra stuff like this. So. In general, I'd just say, uh, like we said before, if, if an agent is making you use a deposit replacement product as a condition of the let, then that's a prohibited payment and they can't do that. You can always choose to use a free deposit scheme where you just pay the money into you know, TDS and then they protect it. Um, so don't fall for that. You don't have to use these if you don't want to. Um, and secondly, just remember that they're essentially products for landlords not to make your life easier as a tenant um, it's a way that like landlords can export their risk to a company um, and appear to attract more tenants and get more inquiries um, and the, the final point is uh, it, it's a, I think it's an example of a poverty premium because if you have enough money to pay you know five weeks deposit up front and not pay any fees on that uh, and not pay to access one of these deposit replacement products then you would always do that, right? Because that's just a free, a free service. Um, whereas the people who are most in, incentivized to use um, a deposit replacement product that costs money, uh, that won't be refunded, um, are people who can't afford that. So yeah, that's just something to keep in mind if you come across um, deposit replacement products. So um, yeah, I could go on and on, but uh, I'll, I'll limit it there. Uh, those are my top tips tips for, for finding a place to rent. Great. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, on just sticking with sticking with you, Sam, um, we've had a question in on the chat, uh, um, which I'll find again. Um, someone's asked about, um, sorry, where's the chat? Here we are. Um, does an agency have the right to ask for three months bank statements? Is that so in just in terms of um, uh, the, the, the things that, that can be asked for in a um, uh, as part of the referencing, referencing process? Is that is that acceptable? Is, is there, are, are there any are there any limits to what? Blessing agents can ask for. That's a that's a great question about legal limits. I'm, I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Um, it's definitely common practice for landlords and agents or or their referencing partners to ask for detailed financial documents like three months of bank statements. Um, so that definitely happens a lot. And I mean, no one's getting well. Maybe Andy would know better, but I don't think anyone's getting in trouble for that. Um, so I would say yes, that is. That, well, saying they have the right to, I don't think it's illegal or unlawful or prohibited by any legislation to do that if those companies are regulated in the right way. Yeah. 
All right, thanks. Um, I've got a question that um, possibly uh, Sam or Andy could answer. Um, so um, it's about uh, ending the tenancy early. Um, is the so, so the, currently you, the Ten Fees Act is, makes a permitted payment to uh, to charge rent uh, in order to in order to sort of charge rent that, that would have been paid if, if the tenancy had continued, and then it, it's a, it's the re landlord's reasonable cost essentially. So once they find a new tenant, it's it's unreasonable for them to continue charging that. What are the reasonable costs to end the tenancy in that situation? Um, particularly when we don't know how long it will take to relet the property when, when you're a tenant in that situation. Okay. Um, we, we don't know how long it's going to take to relet the property. And I don't, there isn't a kind of, of tariff um, that I'm aware of that, that would make it simple enough to do a calculation. When you're renting, if, it, if it's a 12 month contract, the landlord's entitled to expect that you're going to stay there those 12 months. And while you certainly can move on and you, know, you, you, you just pack your case and walk out the door, nonetheless, he's entitled to expect that he's still going to continue getting the rent for that place, whether you're in your room, whether you're in that, in that flat or whether you've moved somewhere to the other end of the country. You can't just walk away from those responsibilities. The agent should um, make all reasonable endeavours to try and find another tenant. But depending on your situation, it may not be easy. Um, it's quite possible in certain places around the country that you could fill a room, you could fill a flat within 24 hours of someone saying they want to go. Um, equally, um, for instance, if you're in a student let and you're halfway through term and people have already tied up their um, accommodation for some time, it's going to be much, much harder to find someone who's going to step into a room with four other people halfway through um, an academic year. So there will be charges and yeah, the agent's going to advertise. The landlord's also going to have to look at the tenants and decide whether those people, with good reason, are suitable to fit into fit in with the other people who are you know if you're an HMO if you've got a room in a house with other people whether those people fit together as well so it, it's not not at all easy I'm, I'm gonna let Sam have a say on sort of how fast the market moves uh, so, so yeah that's gone away from the uh, initial question a little bit perhaps um, in, in, in that case ignore me Oh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I, I didn't know in what context you meant in terms of how fast the market moves, Andy, sorry. Um, Similarly, a question about how fast agents can get new tenants in if they really, really try. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it depends massively on the area. It, uh, it wouldn't be unusual for, for agents in, in central London to in, for decent properties in high demand areas to see over 100 inquiries in, in a couple of days. But equally something can be sitting on the market for, for months uh, elsewhere. It, it really is super local. And that's why one of the first things I mentioned earlier was to, is to find out um, in your area, how quickly things move. Yeah. Okay, I've got another question. I've got a question for that Sandy might be able to answer. Um, this is uh, asked in the chat, um, what constitutes professional cleaning such as for a carpet? I was told the owner had had a professional carpet cleaning done before I moved in. But I, didn't see any proof of this in terms of costs or standards expected. And I've been told I need to have a professional carpet cleaning done before I leave. Now, is that something that's legitimate uh, for, the, for the landlord to, to request? Um, sorry, oh, Sandy, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, just realized, apologies for that. Um, uh, so um, a, t a tenant obviously is only required to return the property to the same standard as it was at the start of the tenancy. Um, and the starting point from an adjudication perspective is that the, the deposit belongs to the tenant and it's for the uh, um, agent or landlord to prove with evidence why a claim is justified. So it um, uh, constitutes uh, professional cleaning. So um, I was told the owner had a professional carpet cleaning. So um, 
the, 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 the check-in report should go to the standard of cleanliness and it should indicate whether or not the property was professionally cleaned or not to include the carpet or not. Um, so if you haven't had a copy of a receipt um, to show that it was professionally cleaned, then um, look at the check-in report to see what, um, uh, what that uh, says as to the standard of clean. Um, and it's very different um, a professional clean um, to, uh, as opposed to cleaned to a professional standard with perhaps say a, a rug doctor, somebody hiring, hiring a, a, a carpet cleaner. Um, so in, 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 this, in your particular case, um, if you have been told to have a professional keep clean at the, at the end of the tenancy for the carpet, then obviously that's a prohibit, prohibited um, payment because uh, there is, uh, it's not possible to require um, a, a, a tenant to uh, contract with a third party. Um, notwithstanding that, um, if it was shown to be professionally clean at the start of the tenancy um, at check-in, and if the checkout report uh, showed that the carpet uh, was um, dirty and was in need of cleaning, then it would be possible to uh, um, uh, 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 make a claim from the deposit in respect of that carpet clean, but to, to force you, to require you to, to pay for that uh, um, uh, cleaning is prohibited. Thank you. Um, we've got a question. Um, if a tenancy falls through, but it was the landlord's fault, uh, is it worth complaining to the letting agent as they are part of a redress scheme? Um, so uh, it says they, they will give me back my holding deposit, but I don't get anything for the time they've wasted. Um, is that, I, I don't know, is, Andy, is that something you can comment on? Yeah, I, it, it really depends what, what you're actually hoping to get out of the situation. I mean, any agent should belong to one of the two approved redress schemes, the property redress scheme or the property ombudsman. Um, and all those details should be up on their website and in their branch as well. But they're about the standards of the agent rather than how the landlord conducts themselves. Um, and I think if you're looking for grounds for complaint, it might be if, if you know that this is something the landlord is well known for in the area for wasting people's time for messing people around or for ha having a bad attitude such that the agent should have known that as well um, that's possibly something you can ask the redress scheme to look into um, and they may choose to grant you an award what what that would be i mean it, it's certainly not going to reflect for instance a week's rent if you've had a week's time wasted it's not going to be a chunky thing like that um, but it's the redress schemes are looking at the conduct of those agents rather than the people um, who employ them okay thanks very much um we've got a quick question that sandy might be able to answer um, and then i think we'll have to start wrapping things up i'm afraid um someone has asked uh why is a letting agent permitted to hold on to any interest earned on my deposit or are they um, I presume this is something that's become less of an issue over recent years, just because of um, uh, low interest rates. Uh, absolutely. So um, it, traditionally, I think when there was uh, obviously the, the, the deposit was held by a stakeholder by the agent, then that was a provision that potentially was in a, a tenancy agreement. It would, I imagine, be um, a matter for negotiation, but um, uh, in any event, um, if, if a deposit is registered within a custodial scheme, um, it is not held by the agent. Um, so from the start of the tenancy, uh, it is immediately paid over to the scheme provider. So in that scenario, the agent would not hold the deposit in any event, so they would not be earning interest on it. And um, a, a matter for negotiation, I, I would suggest in relation to uh, who earns interest on the deposit um, within the tenancy agreement, but quite right, as you say, Dan, uh, not quite so. Um, you know, the interest rates not quite so as before. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we've um, just got a few minutes left. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to get through all the questions. Um, but if uh, if you've um, uh, some some of the questions that have come through are um, uh, not quite don't quite fit with today's topic, but um, we do have a, a session tomorrow on uh, quite a wide ranging one, which is 
the responsibilities of a landlord and letting agent. Um, so we might be able to pick up those questions and answer them tomorrow. Um, and uh, just to say that, uh, well, th th thank you for everyone who, who's attended. Thank you to Andy, Sam and Sandy for their excellent presentations and, uh, and answering all these, uh, all these questions. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning about the private rent sector. Um, it's great that we'd be able to have these, um, these experts uh, sharing uh, their insights with us. Um, if you would like to continue to be involved with Generation Rent, um, we've got um, we've got a sign up page. Uh, if you're not already getting our emails, um, we are really keen to hear about your experience as a renter. Uh, you can go on to vent your dot rent uh, to uh, to tell us about your experience, read about what other people have been going through um, in the past year or so um, around the country. We have a renters panel where you can. Uh, basically share your insights, your views, your opinions about uh, various things that we're working on. Uh, that is, uh, that's something we've, we've, we've started properly in the, in the past six months and we're, we've got some more projects on the go with that. Um, we're obviously um, campaigning on a number of different fronts at the moment. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, uh, contact, uh, you can sign up through generationrent.org slash volunteer and uh, if you can spare any money, we, we are uh, entirely, we, we exist entirely uh, on the basis of people's generosity. Um, so the, the link to donate is there. Um, you can also follow us on social media. The, uh, uh, we've got the, uh, the links there. Um, another thing to say is that um, once Renters Rights Awareness Week is over, the last day is on sun Sunday, uh, we'll be sending out uh, and uh, uh, all, all, all the fact sheets that we've produced, but also feedback form um, uh, once, uh, once, once once the week's over, just to find out how you how you've uh, enjoyed and learned from from these events. Um, we're really keen to get your feedback so the next time we do this, uh, they can be um, uh, even better than uh, than today. Um, thank you again to our speakers and thank you for for, for joining us today. And um, uh, yeah, uh, look forward to uh, seeing and speaking to you all in the future. Thanks. <laughs>